First, we're going to dedicate this class to Jacqueline Chaya Estel, Bat Shmuel. Her yard site is coming up, and uh, Bezat Hashem, we want to dedicate the class for her elevation of the soul. And Bezat Hashem, she'll, her neshama should have an aliyah, keep on growing and growing in the spiritual worlds, and she should have a lot of nachat here from her family and for everything that they do for her. Uh, the ones who are dwelling in the earth should rise in the resurrection of the dead very soon with the coming of Mashiach. And Bezad uh, Hashem, next week we're going to be reading the Megillah exactly in a week and a few hours after a, a day of fast. And. Uh, Everything that we read in the Megillah is in our life. The Megillah of Esther is a very, very, very unique piece of our uh, scripts. Now, today we want to touch one thing that is more uh, connected to our reality, is that we, if you look at, it, at our own life, we see that our life is full of changes, like a roller coaster. In Hebrew, we call a reincarnation Gilgul. That uh, Gilgul is like a, a somersault, like a roly-poly. You put your head between your legs and you make a, a roll over. So, of course, a uh, soul can get reincarnated. But even in this, in our life, within 60, 70, 80 years, how many changes are in my life? If I look at my photo album, where I was when I was 10, where I was when I was 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. How much changes went into my life? I don't even notice it because I'm, I'm the one who's looking in the mirror every day. You notice it when you're looking at pictures. Suddenly you're like, wow, look how I looked. Look how I, how, I, how I dressed, look how I thought. And not only that, our life is literally a roller coaster. You don't know where it's gonna take you. you sometimes you're going and whoa, you know, you fall down, take you up, take you down. It's, if you go on the roller coaster the second time, you already know the route. But the first time, you don't know what's, what's waiting, if it's coming a loop, if it's coming a turn. Life is a roller coaster. And we often find ourselves saying, how did I get here? How did I end up here? I was planning on going there, I wanted to go there, and I end up there. <laughs> so, not only that, sometimes you reach a time in my life that I'm stuck, that I'm like, okay, what now? What's next? Where am I going now? Is it time to move? Is it time to stay? Where, where, where am I holding right now? And we want to find an answer to that because this is, a, this is much more questions. This is just the general idea of the question, but we want to find an answer to what, what am I doing here? And what does Hashem want from me? And this answer can be found specifically in the Megillah. Now, at the peak of the moment, at the peak of the entire Megillah Testel, it's a pretty long Megillah. It's going to take us about an hour, I think, to read it, depending which shul you're going to go to. Some shuls, they do it in 30 minutes. And yesterday I told you, I once went to a Yemenite shul and they did it in about three hours. They didn't forget and won't even one vowel. And every word was, ah, 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 three hours. I mean, the fast was not th that hard, like sitting and reading and, and listening to the Megillah there. But, uh, <laughs> so, the peak, the highlight of the Megillah, there's an argument, a, a very harsh argument, between Mordechai and Esther. I mean, most people, they, they go through the Megillah, they don't even know what's going on in there. But in the peak of the Megillah, there's an argument, a very harsh argument between Mordechai and Esther. And here is the, the secret, so to say, of the plan of my life is hidden in that argument. Now, let's kind of backtrack, see what's going on in the Megillah. Haman is uh, planning to kill us all. Somehow he gets, into, he gets the approval of Achashverosh. Doesn't matter right now, he bribed him, whatever it is. He gets the approval. 
Now they go to the print house. Let's start printing the posters and let's find a date. He has now the approval from the president, from the king. Okay, go do it. It's like a, a, the CIA wants to do a secret mission. They need an approval from the president. Okay, Achashverosh gives Aman an approval. Aman starts spreading the word that uh, they're going to kill all the Jews. Now, he wanted to do it in a very uh, sophisticated way. He didn't want to do it with an army. He wanted to make sure that all the civilians of all the countries are uprising against the Jews and killing them in one shot. Okay, what's the, what's the, what's the option here? The heads of our nation are gathered together. Okay, there's a death threat on our, on our, on our heads. What are we doing here? Okay. What's the solution? Ah, oh, we have a solution. Esther is married to the king. Ah, oh, we have an inn. Let's do that. Okay. And they're saying, okay, the, what's better than that? The wife of the king is Jewish. She's one of us. Let's go to her. Okay. All the hopes of the nation is in Esther right now. We, we, the, the people wake up in the morning, they go to the street, they see posters everywhere. We're going to kill the Jews. People are waking up to this harsh reality that Haman has got an approval and he's going to kill everybody. And you know, just imagine what was going on in the streets, the panic. Oh my gosh, they're going to kill us. Just imagine now, you live in some city and suddenly you see posters everywhere. Okay, we decided we're going to kill you all. Okay, everybody's panicking. And uh, the only hope that they have is Esther. Now, they go to Esther and what does she answer? Sorry, I can't help you. What? You married to the king. Sorry, <laughs> can't help you. What do you mean you can't help us? They're going to kill us all. I'm sorry, I can't help us. I can't help you. So, that's what the Megillah says. It's not that I'm uh, interpreting anything. That's what it says. It still says, I can't help you. There is a book, a specific book written on the Megillah, very interesting book. You have to read it. Without this book, you can't understand anything in the Megillah. The book is called Manot Halevi. It's written by Rabbi Shlomo El Kabetz, that is uh, one of our neighbors here. And uh, needless to say, Rabbi Shlomo El Kabetz was a very big Mekubal. The Ramak was his, his student. And, uh, you know, he's, of course, a well known author of the Lechadudi. But uh, nevertheless, he got engaged to a very nice young lady, and he didn't have money. He's, uh, he's, he's been learn, learning Torah to all day long. So he didn't know what to give her. He didn't have money to buy a ring or a bracelet. So he wrote a book, and he gave it to her. That was the engagement uh, present. And this book is called Matnot Halevi, the presence of Halevi. He was a Levi. Rabbi Shlomo El Kabetz was a Levi. So the book is called Matnot Halevi, and it's gems, gems on the, on the uh, Megillah. Really, you really have to read this book to really see the, the depth of the Megillah. Nevertheless, he says there that when Mordechai went to Esther, she answered him, I was not called to the king in the last 30 days. Lo nikreti el melech shloshim yom. Now, what does that mean? There is a story, there is a story in the Talmud, not in the Talmud, there is a story about Eglon, Melech Moab. Remember him? And he did a lot of problems to, to, the, to the Jews. He went and, and uh, caused a lot, a lot of problems. Yeah, so came to him an individual, his name was Ehud ben Gera, who went in, he was the king, king of Moab, and he went there. Now what is this Ehud ben Gera did? He needed to somehow get into the, to the palace. Now, the way it worked in the olden days, that people, the men, would hang their sword on their left side because they were righty. You put your hand like that, and you pull the sword out. So the sword was on the left side. Ehud ben Gera was a lefty. So he put the sword on the right side, and he hid it in his pants. So he was able to go if they didn't have the metal detectors. You know, now everything is metal detectors. You go into the, 
to the airport, take your shoes off, take this off, you get undressed, take your laptops out, your gels, your cream, your... The guy walks in with a sword into the, into the, to the Pentagon, into the White House. They didn't have metal detectors. So he was able to go through the guards and he went directly into the king and he killed him, he stabbed him to death. Now, uh, uh, he left him ble bleeding on the floor and turned out and walked out. By the time that they figured out something's going on there, he was long gone. Like a Mossad agent, went in, out. Assassinated him. Okay. Uh, after that, they made a law. Nobody's allowed to go into the king uh, for a meeting uh, uh, without, uh, nobody's allowed to go into the king without a meeting, without a set, organized meeting. So, even the wife of Achashverosh couldn't go into his, uh, to go to see him. She, Esther said, I wasn't called for 30 days. And Mordechai tells her, you need to be called? You're the wife. You just walk in. No, I have to be called. I have to be called into the king. So, Esther doesn't go into the, to the king. And Mordechai goes and tells her, we're, there, we're gonna be slaughtered. Uh, the whole nation is about to be killed. Go in, go there, make a mess. I don't care what you're gonna do. Go and convince him you're the wife of the king. There is an interpretation by the Malbim that it says that what Estel said, I wasn't called for 30 days, he calls it Dvarim uh, Tfilim. Davar Davar Tafel is something that doesn't have a taste. Sometimes you, I don't know if it ever happened to you that you were invited to a Shabbat meal and they give you like a soup. What is water? They give you a chicken. So I have a friend that doesn't have a control in his mouth. One time we were invited to a Shabbat meal. So we're sitting there and you know, we're trying to be appropriate and we got hot water. Instead of soup, it was hot water. He takes, he's like, this is disgusting. <laughs> and my wife and me are like, oh my gosh. And he just, he's, just, he's like, what is this? What are you giving me, hot water? So then, then they brought something out. It was like a salad. So he tastes it. He's like, ugh, this is salty. What are you, what are you? And, and my wife and me couldn't stop laughing the whole night. He was, and he's, and he's not like a mean person. He just says what he, what he feels. Anyways. Something that is called tafel is something that doesn't have ta taste. So uh, the Malbim says what Esther says is dvarim tfilin. It's empty, it doesn't have any taste. So what if, it, what do you mean you weren't called in for 30 days? Anyways, the situation is that there's a message that we're going to be destroyed. Mordechai goes into mourning. It says, Vailbashar of Sakva Efer. Mordechai is uh, saying, what am I going to do here? I'm the leader. They're starting to panic. The whole generation is panicking. What's going on? What are we going to do here? We don't have an army. The Malbim says, how could it be? He asks, how could it be that Esther didn't like just jump on Achashverosh? How can she go crazy here? What, are they going to destroy your whole nation? You're not doing anything. He says, how didn't she go cuckoo to, to save the nation? At this point, Mordechai curses Esther, and he curses her that she will die. This is in the Megillah. I mean, everybody's too hungry, they're not even noticing what he's reading, but Mordechai is cursing Esther because Esther says, I'm sorry, I'm not doing anything. And Mordechai tells her, At uvet avich tovedu. You and the fa your father's house are gonna die. You're gonna tovedu, mean you're gonna be perished. And we don't know if he's meant it in this world, the world to come, but Mordechai actually curses, he says, you're gonna die. You're not willing to help us. You think you're going to be saved? They're going to find out that you're Jewish too and they're going to kill you too. So if you're not willing to save us, don't think you, you're going to be saved because you're in the palace. You're also going to be like... Question comes is why such a reaction from Mordechai? Try to convince her. Be a diplomatic. Be, be diplomatic here. Come and tell listen, this, or come and I don't know what. Why are you, why are you attacking her? What does Mordechai tell her after the argument? Suddenly the argument comes down. And then Mordechai tells her, Who knows that maybe you were brought up here to save us? 
What do you mean, mi odea? You don't, you don't know? Mi odea means who, who knows? Isn't it obvious that the Kadosh Baruch put Esther in the palace only to save us? Why Mordechai, one second he tells her, you're going to die. He curses her. Then he comes down and he tells her, who knows? Maybe Hashem brought you here to save us. What do you mean, who knows? It's obvious that the Kadosh Baruch Hu made a miracle and he put Esther in the, in the palace. There's no question here. What, do you have a, a doubt here that it happens to be that a Shem sent her there? You know, we're going to explain now really what happened there. But when Esther was brought into the palace, she wasn't a young girl. The Talmud says she was 75 years old. And yeah, and she wasn't a, she wasn't attractive even. It does it says that she, you know the story. What, what what was the what was the story there? First of all, it's a very weird concept. Why Esther shook off responsibility? Mordechai came to her and tell her, "Listen, you're you're in you're you're in the high windows. That's how you call it. You're in the high windows. What's the term that you have an in?" to the big offices, the high offices, I already call it. There's a term like that, no? Anyways. No, don't they say in America he has connections to high windows? What? High places. Whatever. Nevertheless, Moldecha tells them, what you, what, what's going on with you? You are in the palace. You don't even have to work hard. It's very interesting, weird why, why Estelle just shoot it off. Now, it was uh, obvious. That the Kadosh Baruch Hu turned the world around to make that Esther will be in the palace. Now, how, how does it all start? The first uh, story that we find in the Megillah is that Vashti died. That's how it starts. Now, how, how does this whole thing happen? Achashverosh makes a party and and the, you know, the party was, he was a very simple man, Achashverosh. He wasn't royalty. He married into royalty. And he married Vashti. Achashverosh was a very simple man. Three years after he got married to Vashti, he makes this big party for six months. We talked about the New World Order. Achashverosh made a party to the elite. For six months, a party that all the VIPs, all the elite, all the hotshots of the entire world came to that party. Now, uh, and remember, Tachashverosh wasn't like a royalty or somebody. He was a very simple man. He just got married to Vashti, and Vashti was the royal family. I'm not going to start saying all sorts of words. It's recording now. But she was from the family, and he just married into the family. You, you realize by yourself which family she was. But nevertheless, the Vashti family. In the middle of the party, Achashverosh calls Vashti to come and join. And you know what? She says, I'm not coming. What do you mean you're not coming? I told you to come. Not coming. You're drunk. You're not coming? Now he has a dilemma. She didn't come. But now everybody's going to look. The king gave an order. And he's just going to let it go. So he makes a whole shtick out of it. And he kills her. To show everybody, nobody says no to the king. Even my wife. You're going to say no to me, I'm going to kill you. Okay. Now, first of all, why doesn't Achashverosh kill her on the f right away? It took him time. He actually went and consulted his, uh, his uh, advisors. What should I do with her? And they came to the conclusion, okay, kill her. Because you need everybody to see that anyone who goes against the king, you have their head. The question is, why didn't he kill her right away? Now, legally, she didn't have to come to the party. You would think that a normal party, then the king says something, everybody has to do it. But this specific party, the, the Hashverosh wanted to make a theme that anybody can do whatever they want. <clears throat> it's called, Hu Kava Lasot Ratzon Ish Veish. That's what it says in the Megillah. Every person does their own Ratzon. That's why, if you notice, it says, that the party was like six months. But you know what was missing in this party? They had everything. Catering from the best caterers of the world, jugglers, shows, everything. Everything that party had. You know what it didn't have? <clears throat> it had drugs too. Everything it had. 
The only thing that the party didn't have is a, par- is a, is a band. There wasn't music in that party. And why a band? Because the whole theme of the party, you do whatever you want. Now if he brings a band, then I'm opposing on you to listen to the music that the band is playing. And if you don't like this band, then you're basically not doing whatever you want. So the whole theme of the party, that's what it says in the, in the Megillah, La'asot ratzon ish ve'ish. Every person has his own, I do whatever I want in this party. Just imagine what a party is. You're saying there wasn't drugs there. <laughs> they, they, probably all the leftovers that we have now is the leftovers from that party. <laughs> so everybody does their own will. <laughs> Anyways, Achashverosh comes to the decision and he kills Vashti. That in itself is a miracle and a half. How do you kill her? That is, is the beginning of the, you see, of the election of Trump. The beginning of the miracle that the Kadosh Baruch Hu started to already start moving wheels there. It wasn't normal that he killed Vashti. Okay. The second miracle, this was the first miracle that Vashti got killed. The second miracle was, is that they brought Esther seven years after he became king. The party was three years after he became king, which means that he killed Vashti. And for four years, he was without a wife. What was he doing for the whole four years? He's not the type of man that's just going to be holy and sitting in his chamber and learning Torah. I mean, we know clearly. The party was three years after he was became king, and, Va- and Esther was brought to the palace after seven years. Meaning that for four years, he was, was without a wife. You know what happened in the four years? It was a huge miracle. They brought women from all around the world. Thousands of women were rushed into Shushan to come to the king. Every lady that walked in, he looked at her, no, no. Next day they bring another one, no, no, it's not my type. And she made a miracle that for four years he couldn't find beauty or favor in any woman. Four years he was single. He had a profile on J-Date and he couldn't find his other half. Finally, they found this little orthodox girl. Just imagine now that they need to bring a wife to, I don't know what, Trump. They're going to Bnebrak and bringing some, uh, some, some orthodox girl, Esther, with, uh, you know. So that, that's the story. Now, they're bringing, bringing Esther into the palace. She wasn't like in her, uh, in her 20s, like a knockout that he got swept off his feet. This old lady is walking in. So, you know, taking her teeth out. <laughs> so, coming with a cane, excuse me, you're looking for a wife? So, they're bringing this little Esther from Bnei Brak, from Mea Shearim, this religious girl, and suddenly he falls in love. Wow, found favor. The Talmud says that she wasn't even attractive. She was old, an older woman. Nevertheless, that's what happened. So, right away from the beginning of the Megillah, two miracles, unbelievable miracles. If you think Trump got elected as a miracle, this is nothing. Here, Vasti gets killed, and right after that, Achashverosh can't find a wife for four years. Finally, he finds Esther, and oh, that's the one. I want her to be the wife. Now, there are two stories in the Torah, in the entire Tanakh, I'm sorry, that Hashem is not mentioned there. Obviously, the story of Purim, Hashem's name is not in the Megillah, not Yud Kevavke, not Elohim, not Alif Dalinun Yud, no, you don't find, hear the name of Hashem, or entire Megillah. You know where else is another story in the Tanakh that you don't have Hashem's name? I'll give you 30 seconds to think of a story in the Tanakh where the Hashem's name is not mentioned at all. I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a... No, not a Yov. I'll give you a, even a, a more hotter tip. It's not in the Tanakh, specific rather in the Torah in the actual Torah, in the book of Bereshit. A story, a big story, lasts in four parashot, and Hashem's name is not mentioning there. The story when Yosef was sold, the whole story of Yosef. The whole story, Hashem's name is not mentioned. From parashat Vayishlach, from the end of the parasha, till parashat Vayigash, which means half of uh, uh, Vayishlach, the entire parasha of Yeshev, the entire parasha of Miketz, half of the parasha of Vayigash, there's not Hashem's name. Wow. 
in any type of way. Open the Chumash, you'll see. Almost four parashot. Hashem's name. I'm talking about Hashem's name. Yeah. Bechlal, Hashem's name. Four parashot. Hashem disappears. Now, what's the common denominator between these two stories? That Hashem sometimes is turning the world around from the back. From the back scenes. How do you call it? Back scenes? The, behind the curtain? Sometimes, behind the stage. Sometimes Hashem is involved. You see the miracles. Splitting on the sea, ten plagues, miracles here and there. Hashem is involved. These two stories, Hashem is underground. Behind the scenes, shh, you don't hear anything, but he's turning everything around. Look at the whole story with Yosef. is a miraculous story. How he got sold, how the brothers went against him, how he somehow get to Mitzrayim. It's the same idea now, like as if now a yeshiva bacher from Mea Sharim will become the king of the world. How does that happen? How is he taken from his yeshiva, a little boy, sitting and learning Torah all day long, suddenly, whoop, the Shem turns it around, he becomes the second to the king that rules the entire world. How does that happen? That's, that's only the hand of the Kadosh Baruch That even Yosef himself, himself said to his brothers, don't be upset, this is all Hashem's plan. Hashem brought me here. Hashem brought me here so I can sustain you and that I can, so to say, prepare the ground. This is clear work of behind the scenes of the Kadosh Boho. Now, in our life, we don't even realize that. But the majority of the time, the Kadosh Boho is running the show in the, back, the backstage. We just don't see it. Sometimes we see how the Kadosh Boho is involved in our life. Sometimes you really see the Ashgecha Pratit, you like, you, you blows your mind. Wow, look at the miracle. Look what Hashem, how He intervened. Sometimes it's very, very obvious how the Kadosh Baruch Hu is running your life. But most of the time, <laughs> I don't see Hashem. I don't see how Hashem, what Hashem wants for me here. When things are going unbelievably, you're like, wow, unbe Hashem psh, really pulled through this time. But most of the cases, I don't see how Hashem is, is in my life. And not only that, I, it's, I, it seems like Hashem is not even in my life. And I don't even realize how the Kadosh Baruch Hu is running the scene Running the show behind the scenes. Anyways, without this uh, uh, whole uh, uh, intervening of Hashem, the miracle could not happen. There couldn't be an option. Why would a Hashverosh uh, will kill Vashti? Why would a Hashverosh want Esther? This is to teach us that there was a, a, a Hashem intervened here and He changed everything in the universe so Esther can somehow find herself into the to the palace, and there's no question about it. The same way how Hashem turned the whole world around, that Yosef will find himself in Mitzrayim, same idea. Now, so we see that first of all, there's the first miracle that Vashti got killed. Now, so when now that we understand that Esther was arranged by Hashem to be in the palace, it's very surprising the answer that she gave by saying, 30 days I wasn't called in. What do you mean you didn't want called in? Who cares if you're not called in? Why are you sending me 30? Just say, I wasn't called in. Why does Megillah say 30 days? So, the point is that the Maharal explains it's obvious that she couldn't go in there. Because she said, Esther said, Hashverosh doesn't like me. He, does, he didn't call me. And if he didn't call me, I understand from that he didn't like me. He doesn't like me. So what good would it do if I come in right now? So Esther says, let me, let, the, the, the decree is a whole year. I mean, the decree was around Pesach time, and the date that was selected was for 11 months later. So Esther says, listen, I have 11 months. Let, let, me, let me schmooze my way in there. Let me be here for a couple months. Let me get him to like me. I will slowly, slowly come in, and then I'll do what I need to do. That's what the Maral explains. The Maral says, no. Esther says, I wasn't called for 30 days. means that he doesn't want me right now. I'm still not under his skin. And you know what? Let's wait that he, I will get under his skin. Let's wait that I can somehow, you know, become a fa find favor in his eye. The next thing that Esther said, this also is explained by the Maral, that Esther says, how can I go in? I'm a Jewish woman. How can I go in and, and 
and make a connection with a man. It's, it's not befitting me. I'm a Jewish woman. I'm, I'm, what am I going to go now and throw my body on a man? And, and that was one of the things that she said. Which one can come and say, okay, she's right. I mean, uh, after all, she's a Jewish woman. She's, uh, she's from Nebrak. She It's not appropriate for her now to just waltz into uh, King's uh, 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 palace and just do what she needs to do. But nevertheless, we know that later on, she was with Achash Berosh. They have a son together. And obviously, we know that there was a relationship there later. So what kind of an answer is she saying that um, it's not uh, appropriate for me? Later on, the... Uh, they, they have a son together, Daryavesh. And, uh, and uh, obviously they were together. Although, there's, uh, uh, one opinion says, no, she, he, rape, he raped her. He, well, she wasn't uh, willingly with him. So, but nevertheless, Esther says that the two things. A, Hashverosh uh, doesn't like me. I don't want to go in there. More than that, she's like, I can't go right now. Right now is not the time to go. Okay. Mordechai answers her, are you serious? There's a gzera, there's a decree to kill all of us. What do you mean you can't go? They're about to kill the entire nation. You know, there's a story in the, in the Tanakh about a certain uh, lady, her name was Yael. And she had the same idea that, uh, that she operated. This story with Yael and Sisra. She brought him into the tent she, you know, belly danced to him a little bit, probably, gave him some wine, and uh, she tired him out, and then uh, killed him. The Gemara says, Gdola avera lishma. If, yeah, of course it was a sin for her to be with him, but the, the sin is so great because she did for the sake of saving the nation. So the Gemara says, no, she, she acted right. She did the right thing. Mordechai answers Esther, what? You want to wait a whole year? Who, who, who says that he's going to like you in five months? You're saying he doesn't like you now? Why do you think you, you can convince him? Why, why, why do you think he... Who says that something's going to happen in the next couple months that you're willing to wait? Because Esther says, let's wait a little bit. Let me, you know, build it up. Well, the says, who says it's going to work? And what if they, you know, change the date now and suddenly they decide to kill us in three months? This is not an answer. <clears throat> The thing is that it's very not clear why Esther didn't want to go at that given moment. And she said it's not the right time. To kind of understand her approach, there is a story, a very unique story, that happened about 250 years ago, give or take. There was a big tzaddik, he's known as the Balatanya, Rabbi Shneur Zalman from Liadi. And he had a student, he's known as the Rabbi Yosef, who was a very unique individual. Right from early stage, they saw that this is, this is, this is gonna be the, uh, a gadol in the generation, something very, very unique. And not only that, that he will become a very big rabbi, and needless to say, became ordained very, very young. He was a very, very unique individual, very smart, very wise, very sharp in the Torah. And one day he goes to his rabbi, and he tells him, uh, what should I do? I mean, I'm already getting to an age, I have to get married, I, what, sh what do you think I should do? Should I become the Avbedin of this city, uh, the Avbedin of that city? What, what? The Balatani tells him, for the sake of your soul, for the benefit of your soul, you should become a taxi driver, a glon. Now we have Uber and uh, yellow cabs, in the, in the olden days, there was a taxi driver, it's called Eglon. You have a buggy and a horse, and you are a taxi driver. It's nothing changed. And you, people hire you to go from one place to the other. And he tells them, Letovat nishmatcha adif eglon. For the benefit of your soul, you should be a glon. A glon? You want me to be a, a taxi driver? Now, it's not like today that you have a car and the air conditioning and the, Eglon has to wash the horse, feed the horse, clean the horse. The horse makes his business on the floor, have to clean that. This is not a, not a good job. Okay, he doesn't know what to do. But 
uh, his rabbi told him so he says he tells me that that's what I'm going to do and needless to say that he already got all sorts of uh, job offers to be a big rabbi over here to be a rabbi over there but his, his rabbi tells him no go to be a neglon but we'll be a taxi driver okay so the rabbi says that's what he does okay 10 years passed and in that years, he didn't get any job offer to be anything. He didn't even work. He just didn't study all day long. One day, one day he understands. He gets a, an a invitation to become a, a, a to do work as a rabbi somewhere. He understood. Okay, now it's the time for me to fulfill the words of my uh, rabbi that I have to become a, 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 a taxi driver. I mean, taxi driver sounds good. This is like a, a driving on a horse and buggy. Okay, so he goes to the yard to the where all the buggy drivers are, all the taxi drivers, and he tells them, I want to become a taxi driver. What? You? Go back to yeshiva. What are you? It's not for you. It's not a job for you. No, he tells them, I want, I want you to teach me. I want to become a neglon. They think that he's out of his mind. He says, no, no, I'm serious. I want you to teach me how to clean the horse, how to fix the buggy, how to do this, how to, okay. And they teach him, and you know what? For a whole year, he's a taxi driver. It's not an easy job. It's not like today, you're sitting in a nice car. Hey, the, the, the rides are very long. Sometimes you ride for three days. Somebody needs to go from this town to that town. Okay, one time, he, he has the night shift. And uh, the, his boss tells him, okay, somebody just called for a drive and, to, and you have to take that person from this point to that point. Okay, it was late at night, so he tells him, okay, we leave tomorrow, early in the morning. I'll finish praying in the morning and then we leave on the ride. Okay. That night, the person that was the passenger that had to go from point A to point B was staying in the same place where this Rav Yosef was staying. And he can't fall asleep because he hears a person crying. He goes out, starts looking around. What's this person crying? And he finds this Rav Yosef sitting on the floor and crying and saying, Tikkun Chatzot. Suddenly, he gets all emotional and he remembers that his father once used to also wake up in the middle of the night, sit on the floor and do Tikkun Chatzot. Now, you know, that young individual uh, wanted to become uh, more in the modern world. He went and uh, learned the job. He wanted to have a business. So he slowly, slowly drifted away from the world of the Torah. And he came to such a point that he was completely uh, a secular individual, secular Jew. And by seeing Rabbi Yosef on the floor doing Tikkun Chasot, got him all emotional. He started remembering all the tunes and everything. Okay, he couldn't fall asleep that night. In the morning before the journey, Rabbi Yosef puts on his tefillin on, talit, and he starts praying, and he prays like Rabbi Yosef. This uh, passenger, oh, again sees him, and he gets even more emotional. Now he sees him praying, and, and uh, he starts remembering his house when he was a kid, and where he came from, and at the end, they go out on the journey, he takes him. As they're driving on the journey, the person becomes, breaks down in tears, and he says, you know what, I... Just seeing you, I remembered where I came from. Please help me do tshuva. I went so far away from, from the Torah and mitzvot that I need you to help me to do tshuva. Okay. Needless to say that he helps him to do tshuva. And uh, after a while, the son of the Balatanya became this uh, person's uh, rabbi. And at some point, he came to him, Rabbi Yosef came to him and he told him, listen, so-and-so, this guy made tshuva, that's it, you, the time of you being a Eglon is done, and you get off the, the buggy, clean your clothes, and you're, you go, go move forward in your life. And of course, he, he stopped being a taxi driver and very quickly got some job offer to be a big rabbi in a very big city. Specifically, specifically, in uh, uh, the name of the city was uh, uh, forgot the name of the city. But nevertheless, he kept coming to his, uh, his rabbi and he telling him, "Why was I uh, 
Why was I chosen to, to do this shlichot? Why? Nevertheless, his Rebbe told him, you were chosen to do this shlichut only to bring this person back to, to, to Judaism. You, you were uh, chosen from Shemaim to bring this young individual to become observant now. And for so many years, you were, you were, you, were, you know, not doing your things. Now, when you're really looking at the story, it comes to teach you that the Kadosh Baruch Hu puts you in different places. And you don't know why you're being, being brought there. This with Rabbi Yosef, he couldn't understand for years. He was, you know, aiming for, for greatness, to become huge. And his Rebbe told him, for the benefit of your soul, go become a taxi driver. And he couldn't understand it, but he was such a... Uh, devoted student that he says whatever my Rebbe tells me needless to say what a tzaddik he was then he did it and later on he understood that the whole thing was only so he can meet that specific Jew that was away from Torah and Mitzvot so he can bring him back to Torah and Mitzvot and once he made tshuva that he says okay you're done your shlichut is done now go to do whatever you need to do and he understood from that and later on he became a very big rabbi I forgot the name he got a a job offer, he became the chief rabbi of a... Uh, can't remember the name. Nevertheless, not so important. The same idea is that's what happened with, with uh, Esther. Esther, Mordechai told her, what are you talking about? Why don't you want to help? Don't you understand that the Kadosh Baruch Hu put you here? This is your shlichut. So Esther asked him, but why me? Why me? Why, why have to do this? Mordechai answered her with two words because she didn't want to do it. He told her, me or there? Who knows? Who knows why you're here? But you're here. We don't know why Hashem puts us in situations. Hashem puts me in a situation, but that's what's called fate. That's where I'm supposed to be. And Hashem, what do you mean fate? There's like a lottery. Hashem says, I need uh, uh, a certain individual doing this job. In any mini mini mo, what pulls out the number? Oh, you go. And I come and ask, why me? Why I have to be going through this test right now? Why I have to be placed in this situation? But the answer is, if you already came to where you are, that's what you're supposed to do. If you're already here, it's not a mistake. It's not that something didn't work out in the plan. If you are where you are, the thing is, it's hard to say if you are where you are. Of course you are where you are. But if you're already in a certain place, that's where she wants you to be. There's no mistakes here. Don't think for one second that you made a wrong calculation or a bad decision and you came to the wrong place. When you figure out where you are, saying this is where Hashem wants me to be. Doesn't mean that I'm going to have to be here forever. I might have to finish my task and move on. But if I wake up in the middle of my life and I say to myself, how the hell did I get here? Because Hashem wants you here. And that's no mistakes here. Hashem put you in a certain place because now He wants you to do something. Now you have to figure out, okay. Now, what do I have to do here? If already Hashem put me here, then He wants me to do something. He doesn't want me to sit on Facebook all day long. That's not what Hashem put me here. Obviously, Hashem wants me to do something here. Now I have to figure out what it is. The thing is that every person, we're all going through these, I called it in the beginning, a roller coaster. In Hebrew, it sounds more better when you say Gilgulim. Yeah, i changing my, my reality all the time. One time I'm here, one time I'm here, one time I'm here. And the easiest question is to ask, why? There's two questions that I really don't like that people ask. One of them is why, and the other one is what if. Why, you'll never get an answer. And what if, it's like, a, this is the most stupidest question. What if? Why, what if? It's not going to happen. And it's not even an option. Why, don't ask, because you're never going to get an answer. And what if? Come on. What do you mean, what if? This is, a, I'm expecting, I'm expecting my five-year-old to say, what if? So these are the two questions that you have to get out of the vocabulary. But nevertheless, we all go through this roller coaster that we ask, why? Why am I here? Why is this happening? Something happens in my life, and I ask right away, why? Now, you know, you're never going to get an answer, so it doesn't really matter. That's why, that's why Mordechai told her, La'et kazot egat la malchut. For this moment, that's why Hashem put you in this... Uh, 
in the, in the palace. When uh, Esther was asking, why me? Mordechai told her, all this show is for this moment, for you to act. You know, I have a story. I once shared it. It's a very long story. I'm going to share the, the very, very short version of it. Many years when I started my, my new life, so to say, so for, I was in yeshiva for a few years. And at some point I needed to, to start uh, supporting my family. I already had a child. It didn't work out just sitting and learning Torah all day long. So we were thinking what to do. Uh, one of my, my serious hobbies before I became observant was photography. I learned professional photography, cinematography, video editing, etc. So my wife says, why don't you become a photographer? I said, ah, ah me, ah, photographer. There's, there's enough photographers out there. She's like, no, listen, I think you should do it. Okay. Whatever Sarah tells you, you listen to your wife. Kol ma Sarah ishtecha omeret shma bekola. I said, okay, fine. Overnight, I became a photographer. The first year was a disaster. We were eating pretzels for dinner. We didn't have nothing. We were so poor. But at some point, there was a breakthrough. It's a long story. I'm really selling the short version. And I became a photographer. And overnight, I became a very successful photographer. I was like the number one photographer in the Jewish community in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in New York and then everywhere else. I became, within a year, I was the, one of the top photographers. Needless to say, it was a business and a half. People for good wedding photography pay $10,000, $8,000, dollars whatever it is. I became very, very popular. And I was very good. Okay, it lasted a couple of years, and what it allowed me to do, which was the biggest blessing, I ended up learning in yeshiva for about seven years. Because I would go do two, three weddings in a month, and the rest of the time sit and learn. So and then, became, then after a while, I became more popular. It wasn't the three, four weddings. Sometimes I would do 10 weddings, 12 weddings, 15 weddings. But it only was in months like Adar or Sivan. The rest of the time, I, I sat down and learned. So I ended up learning for about seven years straight in a yeshiva. And the business, I didn't care about it. I, I barely cared about the business. And, you know, it was perfect, perfectly. Okay. Long story short, to make Bemet a long story short, one time... I'm invited to take, I, I used to get invited to take pictures all over the world. People would fly me into different weddings. I would come with my gear. Okay, one time somebody is inviting me to take pictures in a wedding in Canada, in some small town. There was a Chabad uh, rabbi there. And uh, his son got married. Okay, so they invite me to the wedding. And it was winter. And I fly, and uh, the only way to get to, to this place, I don't even remember the name of the town in Canada, is to fly from New York to Salt Lake City in Utah, and from Utah to fly to that place in Canada. That's, that was the, the route. Okay. I'm sitting on the plane, and we're sitting on the plane, and the plane is not uh, leaving the terminal. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Suddenly, I was pretty close to the wing. I hear one engine stops. And you hear it stop, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound so good. So we hear the, the, from the radio, the captain saying, this is the captain, Mama, we have some technical issue about one of the engines. So, you know, it might take a while. Okay. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's, that's not good because I have a connection flight in Utah. And if I'm going to miss this connection, there's not going to be any pictures in this wedding. Okay, I'm sitting, I have a lot of bitachon, I pull out my book of Tehillim, I read Tehillim, I have full confidence, everything will work out. But everything worked out, after like an hour and something, we got the engine open, okay, we're going. During the flight was some issue with the, with the, with the weather, and Bemeta, long story short, the captain says, we're going to land in a delay and we're landing in this hour. And I'm like, that's not good. That's not giving me enough time for the switch. Sure enough, and I have full confidence. I'm reading my Tehillim, reading Torah. I, I've, I have no doubt that the Kadosh Baruch is going to make everything work. Tov, we land in Utah in a difference of a few a couple of minutes. And of course, I missed the connection flight. Oh, now what? Okay, I go down to the... To the desk what can we do okay we'll fly you to seattle we'll fly you here we'll fly you there i'm like i gotta be tomorrow morning in this city what do you mean fly me to seattle okay we're trying to figure out what to do 
Then one of the guys says, uh, why don't you dry, uh, fly to, to Montana? And from Montana, it's 180 miles drive. Just to take a car and drive. I said, you know what? That's a good solution. I have, I have no problem. Where, where do I need to fly? They told me, no problem. There's a flight from here to a city called Kalispell, Montana. And we'll fly you in there. No problem. You'll be there in the evening. And, and just rent a car and drive to this place in Canada. Okay. I uh, call already the father of the groom. I tell him what's going on. I inform him. Okay. We fly into this uh, Kalispell. The, the, the plane, there was not a lot of people on the plane. It was a plane of like, I don't know, 12 seats. Like this little plane, you know, that you sit like this in the plane. We land in Kalispell. I don't even if to call it even a, uh, to call it even an airport. It was like a road and a little house. We land there. <laughs> like I've never been to such airports. This is like when you're going to like islands in the, in the, the Caribbean. There's airports like that. Okay, before I even said Jack Robinson, everybody disappeared, and I'm standing in this, this little terminal. It's very very small. Twelve o'clock at night, everybody disappears. I'm walking around, I'm looking, uh, okay, where can I rent a car here? So uh, there's one guy cleaning there, and I'm like, where's the car rental uh, offices? Car rental? What car rental? So I need to rent a car. There's no car rental here. So I'm like, so how do you rent a car when you want a car? He's like, I don't know, there's no car rental here. It's a very small town. Okay, so I call the father of the groom in Canada and I tell him what's going on and he tells me, where are you? I tell him I'm in Kalispell. What? What are you doing there? I told him I'm uh, going to rent a car and I'm going to drive up there. He's like, are you serious? That's a 12-hour drive. Oh, no. I told him, no, it's not. They told me it's 180 miles. He's like, who told you that? Told him the, the airline. He's like, it's 180 aerial miles, but you have to drive through the Rockies, and that's like uh, 400 miles in snow, in roads that go like that. That's a 12 hour drive. Besides, who's going to rent your car there? There's like a one horse town. I'm like, oh, great. So he, needless to say, flips out. I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's not even people. I don't even know where I'm going to sleep. I'm like in the middle of nowhere. You know, like have you seen the, in the Western movies that you see like a, uh, the, like a dirt rolling on the... Uh, how do you call it? Tumblebees? Tumbleweeds. Tumbleweeds. I'm, I'm, out in the, I'm out in the wilderness. I see like, whoo. Okay. The guy calls me after like 20 minutes. He tells me, Baruch Hashem, there's a miracle. Uh, a good friend of ours who lives about an hour away from you is coming to the wedding. He's coming to pick you up at 4 a.m. You're going to make it exactly to the reception. Okay. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm looking around. Maybe I can find some hotel. I find some, um, some uh, motel. I go in, shower, rest. I don't have to go to sleep. Okay, I, I didn't even go to sleep. I just rested on the bed. 4 o'clock in the morning, the guy shows up. Looking in the car, I see a guy with a nice long beard. Okay, we get into the car and start driving. And he starts telling me this is this mountain, that mountain is touring me around and we're driving. At some point I tell him, uh, when are we stopping to pray Shacharit? He's like, well, you're going to have to pray in the car because we can't stop for one second. Okay, I'm a good sport. We stop in a gas station, I put my filling on, I'm sitting in the car and I'm praying. And I was just waiting for the point that he's going to take a short time. Then just for Shmonas, let me stop. I don't know, fuel something. I'll pray. Okay, we're driving, we're driving, we're driving. Uh, and we, we're getting very friendly. We're talking. We have a nice drive. After maybe, I don't know, maybe four hours of driving, five hours of driving, we reached in the middle of nowhere. He says, oh, we, we came to the border. Border? Where? I didn't see anything here. We see like a little hut, like a little house. Okay, he stops. And I tell him, where's the border? He's like, this is the border. Okay, comes out this Canadian officer. Not that I'm prejudiced in any type of a way, but he looked like a Nazi. Tall, blue eyes, pale, blonde, boots. He looked, that, just how, how he was going out, 
I was like, that is not good news. He goes like this on the window, window comes down, he leans in, he looks at him, looks at me, looks at him, looks at me, park the car. Hello, good morning, park the car. I'm like, okay, that doesn't sound good. I've been in this uh, scene before. <laughs> we go out, passports. The first thing he asks us, where are you going? We're going to a wedding. How do you know each other? Well, we don't really know each other. We just met this morning. Did he starts asking questions. I'm like, oh my gosh, the guy sees two bearded Jews. Okay, show us your passports. Sit here. We're waiting. Two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. 15 minutes, the guy with me tells me, if we're not out of here, in a minute, we're gonna be late. Okay, I have a full bit of in the Kadosh Bahu. I'm calm, I'm relaxed, Hashem is in control, Hashem is doing whatever, he, whatever Hashem needs to do, He's gonna do. Maybe half an hour later, passes, we keep coming, what's going on, we gotta go, sit down. Then they call me into a room, the guy, there for a few other Nazis, and they're telling me, you ever get arrested? I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound like a good question. I'm like, well, you know, uh, have you ever arrested? Uh, yes. He gives me back my passport. He says, you're not coming into America, into Canada. I'm like, what? He's like, we checked you out. You have a criminal record in the United States. We're not letting you into Canada. <laughs> what? And in my mind, I'm like, who's going to take pictures in the wedding? So I'm like, oh my gosh, how do I digest this? And I'm in full confidence and I'm una, Kadosh Baruch is running the world. The unbelievable Ashgacha Pratit was that like two days before the wedding, the father of the bride calls me and tells me, listen, there is a photographer in our community and he volunteered to take pictures of the wedding. The bride wants professional pictures, so we're hiring you. But we can't let the poor guy down. He wants to come. Do you mind if he's going to walk around there and snap shots? I said, you think I care? As long as he's not in my pictures, who cares? So I'm like, Baruch Hashem, there is a photographer there. Anyways, long story. And this is the, the, the short version of the story. They turn us around. You're not coming into Canada. Okay, we go back to the American side. Now the Americans are like, why, do I, why aren't they letting you in? Park the car. Come in. Oh, great. Tov. The Americans also somehow let us go. We call the guys. We tell them, listen, they're not letting us into Canada. No photographer, no wedding. Okay. And they really, the, the Canadians were on our case because the, the guy who drove me had some books. And he had like three bo boxes of books. He comes to the car, starts looking in the car. Why, what is this? He tells them it's books. Why didn't you declare it? Declare it? What do I need to declare? Oh, you're smuggling goods now into Canada? I mean, they were really, they went cuckoo there. So I'm, I'm just really skipping all the, 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 the juicy details. Never. We drive back, and I'm sitting maybe an hour or two in the car, shocked. I'm like, what? I, 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 I don't understand. I, I, nothing like this ever happened to me. This is going to go down in my record. I didn't show up to the wedding. This is, this is horrible. Okay, my wife calls me, and this was in the mouth. There's barely any service, and I, I kept telling my wife what's going on. Finally, I call and tell her, don't ask. I, they didn't let me into Canada. What? No. I met, long story short, we're driving, driving, and we're being this guy, we're getting friendly. Suddenly, at some point, uh, there was a, a pocket of some uh, reception. My wife calls me and she tells me, tell me, did you put fill in on today? Of course I put fill in on today. How about the guy with you? I said, of course, he's Jewish. Of course, he, yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's observant. He put fill in on. She was like, okay, I just uh, 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 asked so-and-so, like a big rabbi, what, what's going on? And he gave me a simple answer, to, and, and, and he said, you, Hashem did that because you have to find somebody to put filling on. I look around, 500 miles of snow, that direction, all surrounded with snow. So, so the, this guy drives me back to Kalispell, and he says, listen, you know, let's find you a place to stay, and uh, whatever. We drive in there, and I'm like, okay, I'm, uh, obviously Hashem didn't let me into Canada. He wants me to put fill in on somebody. So we start driving around and uh, start asking me, you Jewish, you Jewish, is there any Jews here? Jews, Jews, what are Jews? What are Jews? Don't even know what Jews are. Okay, a couple of hours we're driving around. I'm looking for a Jew. 
At some point he tells me, listen, let's stop with this uh, Louis, uh, Jew search. Let's find you a place to stay because soon there's not going to be light here. You need a place to stay. Okay. So we go to some hotel and, and I come to the counter, comes a nice lady and on her name tag, the name is a very Jewish name like Silverstein or something like that. I'm like, oh, are you Jewish? She's like, no, I'm sorry. So I'm like, so, but it's a Jewish name you have. She's like, well, my husband's Jewish. And I was like, oh, great. Where is he? I need to see him. He's like, well, he died 10 years ago. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's not going to be much of a help to me. Anyways, and I'm like, Do you have, is anybody Jewish here? There's no, the whole town, there's no Jew here. She was like, eh, well, you know, uh, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, they're, they're, they're thinking this way. No. Then she says, uh, uh, forgot his name and he's the, and she's like isn't so and so Jewish <clears throat> and I'm like oh he's a, there's a Jew here so we're like yeah and then so she tells me no but he's working the night shift and I'm like night shift that's not good for me you can't put Finn in the night shift yeah I need it now give me his number no we can't give you the phone number it's personal the policy workers I'm like don't understand I need to put Phil in on him long story short it didn't work out and and uh, I go to my room. I'm sitting in my room like, I don't understand. Oh, shit, what's going on here? I just traveled. I'm a day and a half on traveling. And, and I'm going to be stuck here now because there's no flights out. Only the next day was a flight. And OK, I understand you want me to put fill on somebody. But the only Jew that I found is not working now. I couldn't figure out what's going on. I was like, OK, Hashem runs the world. Let me wait. Long story short. Comes the morning and I have to go to catch my flight. It was way before the time that you can put filling on. And I come, I leave my room and I go to the, to the hotel lobby. As I'm going down, I see a person looking at me from the counter. And he's like looking at a ghost. He can't believe. And he comes and tells me, you this uh, crazy rabbi that came into town and looking for a Jew? I'm like, yeah. And, and, uh, and I look at the name tag. And that was the name of this guy. And I'm like, it's you. He's like, yeah. And, you know, I tell him, don't ask. You know, I, 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 I didn't know what to do with him. I, I, in my mind, I'm like, I got to put filling on him. But it was too early in the morning. It was like 3 in the morning. So I'm like, OK. And I have about 15 minutes to talk to him because I had to go to catch my flight. He came to the shift. And I literally had like 5, 10 minutes to talk to him. And I come and tell him, listen, you know, I, I, you know, I pull out a picture, a uh, uh, picture, you know, those black cards that I have of my near-death experience. I pull one of that, or I gave him a CD. I don't remember. I told him, listen, you know, a few years ago, I had a near-death experience. Listen to the, try to, what can I do with the guy for five minutes? Okay. And I guess I say, okay, I guess that's what I was uh, called here for. I go outside, I'm waiting and waiting and waiting for the shuttle to come. So we're getting too late. I'm like, okay, this is not a good trip to miss flights now. I'm missing all my flights. I go back into the counter and I tell him, where's the driver? When is he coming? They call the driver. The driver says, what? I'm waiting for him in the airport. I said, what do you mean the airport? He was picking him from the hotel to the airport. What? The guy comes and he takes me. He comes late. He takes me and he's driving real, real fast. And the whole time he's like, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know why. I thought I'm picking you up from the airport. Okay. And, you know, we talk, 45 minute drive to the airport. I get to, to, to the airport, that place where I told you it's like a runway and a booth. As I'm walking in, I already see the TSA guy going to me like this. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm getting on this plane. He's like, you came too late. I can't uh, get you on the plane. I'm like, what do you mean it's too late? No, I can't get you on the plane. It's passing the time. Now the airport was so small, I'm seeing the, the airplane outside. And I'm like, but the plane is out there. I can't let you know, we can't take the luggage. I told him, I'll carry the luggage. Like, what is it? You think it's a, a jumbo? It's a little plane with 16 people on it. He's like, no, you're not going on the flight. I'm like, what? I, I, could, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, I can't be stuck here. And he's like, well, there's another flight at one, one in the afternoon. Really? So now I can go back and put fill in on my friend? I call back the driver, I tell him, make a U-turn, I missed the flight. Uh, the guy, <laughs> shock, come back and picks me up. I'm so sorry, I don't know what to do, I don't know I'm gonna be fired. I told him, don't worry, don't worry. The whole drive back, I'm excited. I'm telling this driver 
this non-Jewish driver, I'm telling him, don't you see what happened here? Hashem made me not go into Canada. Now I'm back here. Now I'm here to put filler on this guy. And I'm, I'm telling him the whole story. Look how Hashem turned the whole world around. And I missed that flight and I missed this flight. And I'm not going into Canada. And I'm telling him, don't you see how Hashem is controlling the world? God is controlling. I'm here to put filling on this guy. And, and this driver is, is, with my excitement, I love it. I love it. Yeah. And he's go, he calls his wife, don't ask. This is passenger here. And 45 minutes, we're like two maniacs in the car getting excited. I run into the hotel. I see the guy. I run to him and I tell him, I'm here. I came here. God sent me to you. I came to put feeling on you. And I'm like in the excitement of the moment. And he starts crying. He's breaking into tears. I'm like, whoa, 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 I didn't mean to offend you. I just came to put filling on you. He's like, you don't understand. You don't understand. I told him, okay, so tell me. He tells me, I grew up Jewish. I did a bar mitzvah. I, uh, my parents are Jewish. I'm Jewish. And when I was in the army, I, was, I went to the army, and he was like, I was stationed in Iraq, in this, in Turkey. And, and he went through some type of trauma in the army. It doesn't matter right now. And, and he's like, I lost it completely. And I didn't believe that there's a God after what I saw. And I, I just ran off. I married a non-Jewish woman and I, somehow I found myself here in Montana. And I live my life. My wife is not Jewish and, and I'm, I don't have any connection to Judaism at all. And he's like, and lately, the last couple of years, life has turned around against me. My father died, this died, there, now my, now my wife is very sick, now I'm uh, uh, became sick and this and lost a job. And he's like, lately, life is... And he told me, in the last couple of months, it's even worse, because my wife now has became very, very, very sick. And now they found me, some, something, and I'm, I'm, I'm in a very, very bad place. And a couple of days ago, I broke down, and it's the first time after 50, 60 years, it's an old guy. He tells me it's the first time that I, I called out to God, and I said, God, I, I need your help. I'm, I'm in the worst place in my life. I'm, I'm sinking in quicksand, and I don't know how to get out of it. And I was crying to Hashem, send, send me, send me some, something, some help. And then you show up. And he started crying. He's like, Hashem, listen to my prayer. He sent me to you. He sent you to me. And I'm like, you don't even know what I went through to come to you. Three days I'm eating apples. I didn't sleep. I missed a wedding. I'm driving in the Rockies for 15 hours. You don't even know what I went through to come to you. And really what I told you now is a very short version of the story because I went through so many other things. It was not normal. It was obvious how the Kadosh Baruch Hu just put me there only to find this guy so I can put filling on him. And we went to the room, he put filling on, he put a talis on, he made the netilat yadayim, put a, a charity, we learned Torah for about an hour. We, he was glowing. He, he, he had his request and Hashem sent him somebody. It was a lottery. Okay, who am I sending to Montana? Oh, I'm gonna send alone. Go, get a kick in your tuchis. I Three days, the whole thing was three days. I literally didn't eat anything. I was eating only, only apples, that's what I found. It was winter, there wasn't and there's nothing there. Only for this Jew, and then we stayed in touch and we were still learning the Torah on Skype. And, and the story is very, very long. This is Bemet, the short version of the story. But the point is that sometimes the Kadosh Baruch turns the whole world around. You don't even know what Hashem is doing. And He puts you somewhere to do one thing, to help one person. And Mordechai told Esther, going back to our story, Esther says, why me? Why I have to do that? Why I have to be with this man right now? And Mordechai says, we don't know. We don't know. But that's the fate. That's what Hashem did. You know, it says in the Talmud, in Masechet Sota, page bit, right in the beginning, it says, before that we were born, three things are already decided. Ish ploni leploni, bat ploni leploni, bait ploni leploni, and a sadeh ploni leploni. You just decided already before you're born who you're going to get married, where you're going to live, and what you're going to be doing for parnasa. What's going to be work? Three things is already decided. Every neshama comes down to this world to do one thing. And sometimes it has to do with one mitzvah. Sometimes you come down to the world to do one mitzvah. And you don't know what it is. And you are selected to do this mitzvah. 
And this is the whole point, the whole story of this Megillah is to come to teach me this little point. Esther, the Kadosh Baruch Hu, turned the whole world around to put Esther in the palace. She didn't understand even how she got there. Nobody understood. What is Esther doing in the palace? Kadosh Baruch Hu turned the whole world around to put her there for that one moment that she can do one thing and save the entire nation. This is what happens in our life. The Kadosh Baruch Hu turns the entire world for me to be in one spot. I don't even know why Hashem brought me there. Hashem says, I have brought you there because you have to do one thing. One thing. So this point of the Megillah is coming to teach me Yes, your life is full of a roller coaster. Ups and downs and troubles and you don't even, what does Hashem want from me? Hashem already put you somewhere, there's something for you to do. Now you just need to figure out what. How do I find out what Hashem wants from me? What is my mission in this world? First I have to understand that the Kadosh Baruch nothing happens by chance. Wherever Hashem puts me, that's where I'm supposed to be. And this is what I'm, that is where I'm supposed to be and I have to do something here. This is just to get that out of the way. And the Megillah comes to tell me, yes, the Kadosh Baruch Hu turns the whole world around. I don't see Hashem. I don't see how Hashem is operating here. But it's for me to understand that that's where I'm supposed to be. Now comes the big question. So what do I need to, how do I know what I need to do here? There's a short answer that says when, the ta when your talent meets the need of your place, that's what you need to do. Very simple. Shem gave you a talent, something that only you can do. Or only you can do it in that specific way. It's called a talent. And then wherever you are, there's a need for something. It could be that you go to a town, there's no bakers there. And you happens to be a baker. It could be that you went to a town and there's no gardeners there. And you are, happens to be a gardener. Whatever it is. But the way to know what I'm, I'm supposed to do, where I am right now, is when the talent and the need meets. You have to figure out what's the need of the place where you are. And it doesn't have to be necessarily with money. It has to do with maybe I'm needed to be an educator. Maybe I need to be an example. Maybe I need, I don't know, maybe I'm the 10th guy in the minyan. And I need to be in that minyan. And that's what Hashem wants me to be. Because this minyan, you saw how we broke the vase today. This is no coincidence. When something like this happens, we were praying. In the middle of the prayer, Mordechai turns around and the vase falls on the floor. Shatters into pieces. This only happens when the klipa breaks. When the existence of the klipa is about to explode, it breaks into a, in, in a physical thing. Obviously, we were doing something here. We were exactly 10. Obviously, something needed to happen here. So I need to understand that first of all, the Kadosh Baruch was running the world behind the scenes and I never see why, who and what. And only I can, I can ask why as much as I can. It's not going to help me. But more than that, once I understand that the Kadosh Baruch puts me where I'm supposed to be, now I have to figure out what I need to do here. The simple answer is where talent meets the need. Take your talent and what the place around you needs, that's what Hashem wants from you. And you know what? Sometimes it's something so small. It's not about turning the whole city upside down. Sometimes it's just being you. Just saying one word at the right time to the right person that you change their path completely. You completely change the person's path. One word. And that's literally how it is. Sometimes I see how I'm invited to talk. There's going to be 100 people in the, in, the, in the lecture. It's for one person to hear me saying one word, and I push them a little bit. And you know, when you push something a little bit, it goes far away. In one of my trips, I took once, I don't even know why I did that. I took a train ride from coast to coast. It's like four days. It's like insanity. You're sitting in a box like this. It's crazy. But it made me realize something very, very deep. I said, look at that. 3,000 miles tracks are perfectly parallel from Los Angeles to New York. If one of these tracks will move a micro, micro, micro millimeter to the side, 500 miles later, they split completely. One little fraction it moves. It would split to be completely two ends. Sometimes all you say is one word and you push somebody a little bit, shh, you don't know who you pushed with one word. Pushed good, I'm talking about positive. Yeah, of course, that can work in the negative. So sometimes I will find myself in a place, I'm not there to be mayor. I'm there to be part of the minyan. I'm there to be part of the congregation, part of the group, something, just to meet a certain person and tell him every morning, good morning. 
I don't know what Hashem has in mind for me. I just need to understand that Hashem puts me wherever I am because that's where He wants and I have to do the best out of it. And that's the faith. And it doesn't matter what I'm going to do. If I'm going to move to that town or this town or this job or that, it's not going to change anything. Hashem says, I'm running the show here. I call the shots. I will tell you when you're missing the train and when you're on the plane and when you get the job and you are fired on the job. I run the shots here. And the more that you subdue yourself to me, the more you put this faith in me, then things are going to run exactly how it should run. And this is exactly what the, the, the whole Megillah is coming to teach me. A whole story behind to, whoop, to put one woman in the palace for one moment to say one thing and the entire nation is saved. To teach me that one time I can do one thing, I don't even know how I'm saving the entire world. And I'm all the time at the right place at the right time. I just need to know what to do at the right place at the right time. There's never a mistake. You never end up somewhere by mistake. There's never happens to be that you that something messed up here. If you are where you are right now, that's where you're supposed to be, and Hashem is controlling everything, you, the only thing you need to figure out is what, what Hashem wanted me to do right here, right now. And like I told you, it's where talent meets the need. You figure it out by yourself. Bezad Hashem, take into consideration that Hashem has great plans for you. Sometimes it's one little thing that can change the entire universe and it's you. Just saying one word, just showing up somewhere, just doing a certain action. And needless to say, when you really go and do that with the utmost emunah, believe, I, I know and I trust Hashem and I believe, then Hashem makes miracles like in Purim that the entire nation gets, gets uh, saved. And what was the result? Three years later, they went and built Bet HaMikdash. So that's what is required from us, emunah, to believe in the Kadosh Baruch and to know that Hashem puts me where I'm supposed to be and my job is not to whine or to be upset or depressed or, ups or what is to what, the, what am I supposed to do I have to do something here go find that out you ask for Hashem Hashem will reveal to you what you need to do and Zad Hashem we should merit to really utilize our time the right way and to find what I'm supposed to do everywhere I am so I can do exactly what the Kadosh Baruch wants for me and when I do what Hashem wants for me that's how I bring redemption to the world Zad Hashem, we should have an easy fast and a happy Purim. Zad Hashem, it's in a week, but see, we still, uh, still have an easy fast. We should only, we should, uh, only have simcha, true happiness in our hearts.